Hi and welcome to this FLA presentation on light. Light really fascinates us and has fascinated scientists for many, many years. Light has been with us ever since the Earth was created, but only since Newton started to split light into a prism and get the spectral distribution, science really got into lighting. I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about why we founded Fargo Lighting Academy. It was because everything in our world revolves around knowledge. And we try to collect knowledge. We do that by reading a lot of papers, going to conferences, talking to scientists, doing research. And all that knowledge that comes into us, we then refine and say, how do we use that? How can that benefit our clients, our customers, our salespeople, everybody who works with lighting? We try to interpret it in a way so that we can put it in a nice way so that people may understand what we are talking about because sometimes it becomes a bit difficult. And that's what I'm trying to do now. I'm trying to communicate some of the latest research that we've found when we talk about the balance between light and health. Because there is a delicate balance that we need light to see. We've always known that, but we also need light on our bodies to sustain our health. And that's relatively new even though it's strange because ever since we've evolved, we've always evolved under the spectral radiation of the sun. And before the earth was created, the sun was in the center of our solar system. So everything that has happened on the earth is happened under the spectral radiation of the sun. That means these wavelengths that you show, see here is being emitted from the sun all the way from gamma rays through the visible light and to radio waves. Most people remember from university that you have to avoid all the dangerous stuff the gamma rays and the uh, ultraviolet rays and x-rays and stuff like that. But only since 2002, we've put our focus on the visible light because we need that just like we need vitamins and minerals into our bodies. We need to get that kind of light. Nobody knew that before because it, it has never been interesting because we got it from the sunlight. And we are daylight animals. We lived under the sun for 7 million years while we were evolving in Africa, but we also have to survive during the night. And during the night is our rest, our sleep period. And when we do that, we have a different spectral distribution of light. The moonlight contains a lot of red light. It's very low levels. And when the moon goes away, then we only have the stars left. And that's about the area where our eyes, our vision stops to work. So our vision works perfectly from bright sunlight all the way down to starlight. And it illuminates our Earth. And it's done that for millions of years. The last seven million years, humans has been around. We sort of diverted from the apes around seven million years ago. And that happened in Central Africa, right above the three limits on this picture here. And in that area, if you imagine this, how the light is close to the equator, it's powerful. It gives a certain shadow pattern on your faces. And that's what we are calibrated for. It's only 120,000 years ago since we left Africa. So our brains still think we're in Africa right now. The vision system has been known to us for quite a while that when we, when we need to look around, we see something that's happening in front of us and we see it into our sharp center vision. If you stretch out your arm and look at the size of your nail of your thumb, that's approximately your sharp center vision. It's two degrees and that means that if I'm looking at anyone in the audience, I can only see one person at the time and you have to move your eyesight side all the way around. But on the, on, for that, we get perfect color vision. We got our sharp center vision, and that's the way it worked. And a lot of research has been done on that. What we haven't known for such a long time is that daylight actually triggers another set of receptors in our eyes. We call it the third receptor, and it influences our hormone balances, our core temperature, our blood pressure, a lot of function in our internal organs. So when the light is... When we look at something outside and we have the blue sky above us, the picture of that blue sky comes into our retina and it excites the receptors in the bottom of our retina called photosensitive ganglion cells and they adjust the balance in our hormones whether it's day or night. So that works all very well and everything is calibrated for outdoor life. And remember, it's only 5,000 years ago since we saw the first architectural structures. So for millions of years, we've been living outdoor and then suddenly we start to living in a built environment. So um, these might be beautiful. We still have access to the blue sky. And it only becomes a little bit critical when you move to the industrialization age in London or in the United Kingdom in general, where people started to work in the mines. We had coal-fired power plants. We started to have steam engines. We actually polluted a lot. So a lot of carbon particles polluted the sky. 
there were no more blue skies, no more white clouds, no more sunlight. And if you lived in this kind of environment, you could actually live an entire life without being exposed to sunlight. You could go to work in darkness, work inside in a dark factory, go back home and go into your home. And then suddenly the British children started to look like that. And nobody could understand what happened to our children. Why do they get rickets, the bone softening disease that you see on this picture? And at that time, nobody actually really connected it to the amount of light that was emanated or radiated on their bodies. But then some scientists say, why is it that the children that are born in our crown colonies in India, they don't have rickets? And that's mainly because down there they still have a beautiful blue sky and a bit of a different dress code, so they get actually their bodies exposed to sunlight and daylight all the time. And that exposure generates D vitamin. And when both the mother and the father are lacking D vitamin, you get children with rickets, a bone softening disease. So that's one very typical thing that shows directly that you have, if you don't get daylight exposure on your body, you become sick. Another thing I would like to share with you is this device that was built in Copenhagen by Nils Ruiberg Finsen in the beginning of the 1900s where they actually cured tuberculosis vulgaris, which is a nasty skin disease. And um, they did that by capturing daylight in sort of like a mirror tunnel, the, the one in the center of the picture, and then guided the light through optics on the diseased part of the person's skin. Now, Finson found out that if you put a metal halide lamp in there and put a mirror up, you can actually use electric light instead of sunlight to cure the diseases. So that's how light therapy began. And in this case, we were working with tuberculosis vulgaris. And uh, for that, Nils Ruber Finsen, he got the Nobel Prize in 1903. This was actually the first time where we talked about light therapy instead of helio, which is actually sun therapy. That kind of light therapy kicked off and rich, rich persons had, could afford to send their children into the high Alps in the uh, Switzerland, Austria, southern parts of Germany, even the United States where they were lying in hospital, for instance, with tuberculosis, and the only thing you could do was drag them out, get them exposed to daylight, and put the beds back again during the night, and that might, in some cases, cure it. That wasn't the biggest hit rate in the world, but it worked. And these people who uh, worked there was some of the best doctors available at that time. And it is that light was the only medicine we had at that time. There were no antibiotics, nothing like that we have today. So the only thing that could kill off germs were light. And the best research that's done in light and health is done during from the 1890s up to the 1920s because at that time there were so many resources and these guys here were the hero of that time. Another thing is fashion. Coco Chanel, who uh, was sort of the fashion icon in the 1920s, she was um, accidentally falling asleep on a sailboat on the way to a fashion fair in Paris. And we have to remember at that time, if you were in control, if you were rich, you had a pale skin, and the, pure people, the poor people had a suntan. And that was about to change because people started to go on vacations, and the poor people started to work in the mines and in the factories. So they started to get pale, and the rich people started to get a suntan. So when Coco Chanel showed up at the fashion fair with a suntan, that was a, wow, now that's in fashion, that's the way we do it. And um, if you think that a little suntan is nice, then a lot of suntan is not that nice. And that's why a boost of skin cancer suddenly happened because people started to expose themselves much more to sun in a concentrated way that we didn't do earlier. So we've talked now about can skin cancer, rickets, and, and uh, curing uh, tuberculosis. That was all done by light in the turn of the century. And when we look at the spectral distribution of that light, this is a spectral distribution of daylight. It contains a lot of green and, and yellow, which is good for our vision, and a lot of blue, which triggers the biological part of our vision. And when we look at the, uh, the night curve, it switches much more to red and deprives a lot of the blue light. So we're actually having more red light during the night and more blue light during the day. And when we look at the modern light sources, light, LED light sources that we use all the time now for lighting, we have to think about that the cool ones with a color temperature of 6,500 has a lot of blue in them and very little red. They're very good for lighting during the daytime, but we should think about it during the nighttime. Because when we go to 2,700 Kelvin, which is the more reddish, you see on that curve we have more red light here 
and less blue light. So um, the secret that you have to remember about biology and light is that biology is primarily depending on intensities. You need a lot of light, like the power of the blue sky, like standing on a beach, looking over the horizon, and getting that amount of light. So you can't do biology with a little light. That's actually emotions. So if you change the color of the light from warm to cold with low lighting levels, you invoke or you actually influence people's emotions. But if you want to measure a difference in core temperature, digestive system, hormone balances, we need a lot of light. So the three things you could take home with you today is that our bodies are built and evolved under the African sun. And that's actually, if we want to have a raw model for how light, good lighting is, look at the African sun. And light influences our bodies in many, many ways. This is just a snapshot in time right now because this is what we know today. But every convention you go to, every paper you read, every published research article tells us something new every day. So this is just, we're just scratching the surface from now. And we need to remember that we need the right amount of light, both in intensity and wavelengths, to strive to live good as human beings. So both, both factors are really important in maintaining our health and our good mood. Thank you. Very much.